In this episode of Mississippi Roads, we'll profile Fannie Cook, the founder of the Mississippi Natural Science Museum. We'll educate ourselves on some environmentally friendly practices and look into the preservation of a Mississippi bird. I'm Walt Grayson. Welcome to Mississippi Roads. We're using the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science as our home base this week because all of our stories are sort of centered around the theme of conservation and nature, especially this first one. In the early years of the 20th century, Crystal Springs native Fanny Cook noticed that the natural resources in Mississippi were being threatened. So she devoted the rest of her life to conservation and education and research. And today her influence is felt all over the state especially right here. Watch. Born in 1889, Fanny Cook was a woman ahead of her time. The Crystal Springs native was passionate about nature from an early age. And anyone who enjoys the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, or for that matter, any of our state's natural resources, owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to Fanny Cook. A lot of people in Mississippi don't know about Fanny Cook. They don't realize the museum is the Fannie A. Cook Memorial. They don't know about her, her influence in the state. She was an integral part of Mississippi's history. She basically went and observed flora and fauna, animals, plants, and everything. She had specimens, a lot of specimens, and it was really neat because she was, a, she was an innovator. She had left the state to teach, but ended up working at the Smithsonian, where she became convinced that Mississippi's natural resources were in grave danger. Citizens of the state were complaining because there were no deer or turkey for them to hunt. We had lost a lot in Mississippi, you know, um, droughts and fires and, as she says, game hogs and unlicensed trappers, and they were all seeing which could, you know, take the greatest toll of wildlife. And she realized then that, you know, that we needed to do something, and she was the person that was going to do it. So she decided to return home to take on the daunting task of convincing legislators to establish a commission to oversee game, fish, and wildlife. We think of her today primarily as the founding director of the Museum of Natural Science. It was really a way for her to get the Department of Wildlife, which was at that time the Game and Fish Commission, because having worked at the Smithsonian, she saw the value of exhibits and education programming. She knew that to get these game laws and to get the a law enforcement agency started, she had to have the goodwill of the people. So she used education and exhibits to interest people. Once you learn about things, you tend to respect it more and you think about it and you develop an appreciation for it. And so after she worked six years at the Smithsonian, and then she came back full time and this was her deal. She was gonna get this done and it took her about six more years to get it done. And so when the legislation finally passed in 1932 and she gets uh, a position with the agency, then she can finally start collecting and, and finding information that they need to enforce game laws and to, um, you know, start with real conservation efforts in Mississippi. She loved to collect. She loved the outdoors and loved going outside. And, and the, it was said about her that she had a love affair with nature because she would row out in her little boat out into the Gulf of Mexico when the migratory birds were returning from South America. And the, the birds would land on the boat and on her and she would give them water and they would go back to shore together. And some of those birds would return to her year after year. The collection was important for the first thing to start off because nobody really knew what was here. Miss Cook uh, hired local individuals uh, to help do the first organized survey of the flora and fauna of Mississippi. Now, some people are a little shocked to know that, you know, Miss Cook shot things, you know, and you're thinking, well, she loved those birds, why did she shoot them? That was the way everybody did back then. You know, Audubon shot all those birds before he painted them. It was really the only reliable way to do it. There weren't good cameras, there weren't color cameras. 
cameras at the time. If you wanted to preserve something, you were going to shoot it and taxidermy it. And if you needed an image of it to send to somebody, you were going to have to paint it. But as scientists, we know today that a little bit of scientific collection is not anything that's going to hurt a population. What's going to hurt a population is destroying its habitat. So she kept a written log of all of her collections, documenting her surveys throughout the state. Not only was it crucial to my job, but it was so neat to see her descriptions of uh, the local areas and the habitat, and she kept very detailed notes. And so that allows us as researchers today at the museum to go back and compare between the past and the present. Where were the game animals? Where were they in enough abundance that we could have a hunting season? And where were they in such short supply that we needed to protect the population for a while. She said the game wardens, you know, she said they thought I was a strange old lady <laughs> because I'd be out there wading in streams and creeks and seining fish and they just couldn't understand that at all. Why, why some old lady would be doing that? I have seen pictures of Miss Cook out in the field wading through the swamps. And she did things at a time when women weren't. You know, there were women out there in biology, there were women who did field work, but it wasn't the norm, and certainly not in Mississippi. You know, obviously she was the kind of person that didn't care, you know. She was going to be her own person no matter what. She did what could be done at a time when there was very little funding. See, all this happened in the depths of the Depression, you know. So 1932, that she was thinking about this when other people were in bread lines and everything else, but she knew this was an important part of recovery too. You know, if you weren't gonna recover the state's habitats and game, then, you know, people needed to eat. Well, they probably needed a deer. They needed venison and everything else. They weren't gonna get that if, if those populations got wiped out. They didn't know how long the depression was gonna last all her life she had been interested in education and teaching young people I think especially. She had a little milk truck and she drove around and showed specimens off. Now the museum we have an education department that does that. She did the the exhibits at state fairs and county fairs. She continues that and leading field trips up until the day she dies virtually. I mean a, a, the story is that she led a field trip for students and the next day she passed away. So that was something that was very near and dear to her. She was very passionate about Mississippi and native things in and around Mississippi. And it actually developed my passion and what I do now. Uh, one of our young biologists has really taken that work and those photos to heart and uh, has become very engaged. I think Miss Cook played a large part in that. I know, of course, that she would be pleased that the collections have grown so large. There are now over a million specimens in the collections, and I know that would please her. She could not have dreamed of, of something like this. She would be overwhelmed at all of the activities that are going on now. I think she would definitely be pleased. In our next story, we're going to be traveling just right down the road from where we are right now to Belhaven University, where some students are studying green chemistry, which is an approach to chemistry that's much more friendly to the environment. And they're putting into practice what they're learning out of the Jackson Zoo. I would probably say for the past 50 years, uh, chemistry programs mostly uh, in undergraduate educational programs have not changed that much, even though science and technology have absolutely changed. So when uh, Bellhaven decided to upgrade its chemistry and science program overall, it was really about being really high tech, really relevant in the modern world, et cetera. What we wind up doing a lot in our chemistry program for green chemistry is students will learn how maybe a reaction in an organic reaction was done traditionally 
and then we redo the same reaction but now using a green approach and there's a lot of really surprising interesting uh, ways in which we work for example we don't use a lot of Bunsen burners anymore uh, we use microwave ovens. If that, the, there are a lot of reactions that work in microwave ovens uh, quite well. We use a lot of instrumentation. So one of the principles of green chemistry is to analyze the reaction as you're going. So students are actually getting hands-on uh, experience with research grade pieces of uh, chemical instrumentation that they're using on a routine basis as part of their regular classes. And this is not just equipment that a handful of students get to use, but that all of our students are really required to use. So how do we train students to not only do great chemical things, work, work in chemicals, uh, chemical industry, but also do a better job at keeping it clean and environmentally friendly and safe, not only for the community, but also for the students and workers themselves. So if green chemistry is focused on um, pollution at the molecular level, that is we change um, whatever the chemical might be so that it's safe for us, it's safe for the environment, then we later don't have to go out and um, get stuff out of creeks, we don't have to get stuff out of wherever it might be, which of course helps the water supply not only for us, it helps it for animals, it helps it for agriculture, it helps it for all sorts of things. Well, it also gives us opportunity to be able to reach the Jackson community to work with the businesses here in Jackson so that um, we can provide some sort of research for them, little things. Obviously, we're not big enough to do large-scale research, but, but we can do a lot of little things to help out our community. The Jackson Zoo uh, approached Bellhaven um, last year, this time last year, and asked the question, how could we be partnered with each other? As we talked more and more about the resources we needed and the fact that the zoo is a teaching element in and of itself and we want students and teachers to use it, um, it just really blossomed into a wonderful relationship that not only are they using us as a classroom, but they are assisting us in so many ways. Most importantly for us right now, they've been doing water studies. And it's not just the quality of the water and the clarity of the water and chemical makeup of it, but the biggest challenge we face, because we're a hundred-year-old zoo sitting on hundred-year-old pipes, some of them are even terracotta pipes sometimes, is that they're really helping us pin down where our water comes in from the city, where it goes, how it goes, and where we're losing water. So their tracking mechanisms and the partnerships they've used, the students have learned so much working with these other subcontractors, this is going to be a boon for us because it's going to help us not only with our new master plan, but help us manage our water resource better. Everything that we talk about green and teach about green, that's something that they are incorporating in their studies. And so it just seems like a win, 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 and the third win is for the animals, really. That project is really about helping the zoo themselves be more sustainable, connecting the community to their, to their challenges, the challenges that they face, and um, how we could just use a lot of manpower of smart students to help them by collecting data. Besides just being students in our program, they themselves are leaders. Bellhaven has at the core of its mission that we're going to make societal leaders, community leaders, and we call that a servant leader. All along the coast in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, um, industry is huge, especially with the oil companies. And so learning about green chemistry equips us to go into those industries um, along the coast in Mississippi um, and bring a new, fresh perspective. I think this is the wave of the future, and we just have to be on the front end of it. Being a scientist is a fundamental thing that makes us all people. You know, I mean, we all use the experimental method, scientific method, every day of our lives when we choose a way to get to work. Um, and we just want to take away the sort of mystery of science to even non-majors and make science accessible to a lot of different people. In our next story, we're going to travel down to the Gulf Coast to Gaucher, where conservationists are maintaining the habitat of the Sandhill Crane. Now, you know, the Sandhill Crane almost went extinct in Mississippi at one time, but now they're once again flourishing.
Well, uh, the Mississippi sandhill crane, as you know, is a critically endangered species. Um, in 1975, there were only approximately 30 left in the wild. Um, at that time, efforts were uh, made to establish the refuge and also to protect and preserve not only the Mississippi sandhill crane, but what was left of its habitat, which in itself is also endangered, the wet pine savanna habitat. When the refuge was established in the mid-1970s, there were only about 30 to 35 Mississippi sandhill cranes, including just five or six nesting pairs, so not many of them. Beautiful. Probably one of the rarest bird populations in North America. So there was a challenge to increase the population. So a lot of conservation work has been going on here and continues. One of the things we do is habitat restoration. So we want to restore and maintain the refuge into, in its original character. And that is this open landscape of a savanna, which is a grassland with just scattered trees and shrubs. The wet pine savanna habitat used to be found from the Texas Gulf Coast through Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. Um, now only 3% of that habitat is left. Um, so like the crane, they're intricately tied together. As the habitat started to disappear over time, the crane started to disappear. So the best way that uh, we have found to effectively uh, preserve and restore the wet pine savanna habitat is to use what we call prescribed fire. Um, every two to three years, we'll go through a certain section of the refuge and actually burn through uh, with a prescribed burn. And uh, that will help to open up the understory and promote the growth of the fire adapted plant species that we have here. Uh, Mississippi sandhill cranes are uh, more of a ground bird, so they need that wide open space for feeding um, to, to feel safe um, and uh, to find the food that they prefer. I would think most ecologists, plant ecologists, would consider the wet pine savanna one of the rarest ecosystems in North America. It used to be found all along the outer coastal plain in the southeast, not only in the Gulf Coast, but the Carolinas. The sandhill cranes were adapted in the central Gulf Coast to these wet pine savannas. So with 98% of this habitat gone, that's the main reason that they're only found now, Mississippi sandal cranes in Jackson County, Mississippi. The Mississippi Sandal Crane National Wildlife Refuge is part of a system. There are over 560 national wildlife refuges nationwide with at least one in every state. And this one was set aside for this crane and its habitat. So this refuge is about 19,000 300 acres, so about mid-size as far as the nation goes. There are two populations of captive Mississippi sandhill cranes, one near New Orleans, New or uh, the Audubon Species Survival Center, and one near Jacksonville, Florida, the White Oak Conservation Center, and they are conservation partners with us. And they have captive populations that produce juveniles, full-grown crane juveniles that we bring over here and release each fall. We've been doing that now since 1981. The population now is about 125 cranes and that includes 25 nesting pairs. And so that is approaching some of our recovery objectives, which is about 130 to 170 cranes, including about 30 to 35 pairs, breeding pairs.
So the release of captive reared cranes is the longest and largest of its kind in the world. In fact, many of the lessons we've learned here in Mississippi have been applied to other crane releases in the U.S. and worldwide. One of the key concepts in conservation in nature is maintaining as many of the native species as you can, because that's going to retain the full functioning of an ecosystem. And so the work we do for managing the habitat for the cranes is also benefiting all these hundreds of native animals and plants. There's a very, very high species diversity of plants here. At the ground level, there may be 30 to 40 species per square meter. That's more plants packed into a small area than any place described in the world. So we have lots of carnivorous plants, probably 12 species, many orchids, and several other plant families that are not very common elsewhere, but are really found here. So it's an amazingly rich and diverse plant community, especially herbaceous plants. Because we've constructed several small ponds for the cranes for roosting, that means sleeping, we have uh, quite a few frog species here, and we do a frog survey. And one of the more exciting things here at the refuge, this is the second year of a translocation project to bring in the dusky gopher frog, which is one of the rarest amphibians in all of North America. It's only found in a handful of ponds in South Mississippi. And so uh, we uh, grew and released well over 1,200 kind of froglets last year. And we're getting ready. They're growing in tanks in the refuge now. Um, and we're getting ready to release them onto a pond. And again, hopefully we'll make a self-sustaining population of dusky gopher frogs, which sometimes are called the Mississippi gopher frog. Again, very rare amphibian. Growing up in Ocean Springs nearby, I, I knew of the refuge, but I didn't really understand the plight of the Mississippi Sandhill Crane. Um, you know, sometimes when you grow up with a species in your backyard, you, you take it for granted. You, you don't understand, wow, there are only approximately 130 of these birds left in the world. And so my hope is through uh, my work here and my work with my coworkers that we can change that and reach out to not just people on the Gulf Coast, but other Mississippians that we have a really unique species here, really a Mississippi original. You, you can't find it anywhere else. So we hope people will come and, and enjoy that species and help us to be good stewards of this habitat. Hey, that's all the time we have for this show. If you'd like information about anything you've seen, you can always contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads. And like us on our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson, and I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You know, we really enjoy bringing you Mississippi Roads every week. We appreciate you watching it. And we really appreciate those of you who support Mississippi Public Broadcasting because your support of MPB not only helps programs like ours stay on the air, but other MPB productions. 
Your contributions also support everything from MPB original documentaries to MPB radio shows to MPB's literacy outreach programs in homes and schools statewide to programs like our reading services for the blind and our emergency communication services during hurricanes and other disasters. You see, we do a lot of MPB and we depend on you to help us do it. If you'd like to contribute now, please go to our website, mpbonline.org and click donate now in the top right corner. Because when you do that, you're helping MPB help all Mississippians. Because like we say, Mississippi is our mission.